Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Travis, and I am the acting Spotted Lanternfly National Policy Manager. It's a privilege to be here today, and I'm hoping to share with you uh, a little bit about the Spotted Lanternfly program and specifically uh, the reporting process. If you find Spotted Lanternfly in your state, uh, what, uh, had to report that detection uh, to the appropriate officials or appropriate people. So again, thank you for, uh, for being here and participating. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's my pleasure being here. So as I said, my name is Matt Travis. I'm the Acting National Policy Manager uh, within Policy Management within USDA APHIS. Uh, I'm also currently the multi-state coordinator for spotted lanternfly and field operations, meaning I'm dealing day to day with the operational aspect that occurs in. So I'm filling both roles right now, kind of wearing dual hats and, and uh, juggling those balls as best as I can. Uh, I'm um, also accompanied in my work with Greg Parra, who is a staff scientist with Science and Technology. Uh, Greg is the lead scientist and has been with the program, with the Spotted Lanternfly program, since the very beginning. Here's our rough agenda for today. So the program, Spotted Lanternfly program, really is focused on currently suppressing and reducing the Spotted Lanternfly and sp Spotted Lanternfly populations throughout the 14 states. And so to do that, we have six primary goals of the, for the program, based first on control measures, based on data, based on established populations in the infested areas. We also look at control measures in terms of lanternfly. And I have a map following this, we'll show you currently 2022. But essentially, this is where we have seen it expand uh, throughout the region, throughout the 14 states, through starting, of course, in Pennsylvania, and then spreading to the west in Pennsylvania, also to the adjacent states, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, up into New York, certainly into Connecticut. This year, we've seen it move into Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We have additional populations in New York, populations showing up in Ohio. Certainly, we've seen this population find its way to southern Indiana, as well as into upper Michigan. And so looking at 2022, this is what we're currently looking at in terms of detections and populations that we are aware of as of right now. The newest populations, of course, Michigan in Oakland County. Again, in Indiana, we had a population in Southern Indiana, North Carolina in the area of Kernersville and recently Surrey County. We've had detections there as well as again, Rhode Island and, and the Massachusetts area, it is also expanded. Recently, we also just this month had a report of spotted lanternfly detection in Buffalo, New York. And so where are we seeing it? Again, high risk pathways. We know that this is a prevalent hitchhiker. It makes its way uh, you know, pretty readily through tractor trailer traffic, maritime cargo and maritime movement, movement of military equipment, also by rail. And so looking at these areas, these are the areas that we focus the most on, the areas that we know that high risk or high risk of further distribution, long distance distribution uh, from its known currently established states into other states. These are the areas that we're most focused on as a program. Again, just to highlight where we're seeing it along rail, transportation pathways, tractor trailer pathways, tractor trailer stops, rest areas, the highway. We've seen this pest, this insect move its, move uh, all these ways, all these pathways and use these pathways to move further and further uh, from its known established states into other states. So again, looking at these pathways, we've analyzed this quite frequently. We're looking at high risk, looking at our survey data that we've collected and looking at the risks. And in this map, you can see that major roads and where we have had some of the areas of highest risk occur along the highways, just simply identifying and supporting what I've said that 
transportation pathways, especially the highway tractor trailer traffic and movement of cargo by tractor trailer is certainly uh, a primary pathway that we need to be considering. Again, with rail, very similar to highway transportation, rail has been a prevalent pathway for movement of the spotted lanternfly along rail throughout the region, certainly out of Pennsylvania, up into Ohio, out into New Jersey, down to Delaware, Maryland, down into Virginia and to the south. We've seen it move along rail and a lot of times detections do occur well within the corridor, rail corridor or within sight of a, a railroad spur or rail yard. And so we continue to perform survey, uh, again, prioritizing those high risk pathways using visual survey. Certainly public reporting is very important. So the message in reporting is extremely important. Uh, getting the message and getting the right information in the message is extremely important and allows officials to follow up to be able to establish whether or not there truly is spotted lanternfly in the area, in the region. We are using currently circle traps and sentinel trees as detection tools. And we continue to look for other survey tactics. We do not have a lore currently with any of our traps. And that is, of course, a limitation. So the survey, survey that we have does rely very heavily on visual and the circle traps and public reporting. So let's talk about program reporting. Some things to just keep in mind as we report in general. Knowing, knowing the hosts and knowing the lookalikes. Knowing what tree of heaven looks like, Atlantis altissima, the most preferred host, is very important. But also knowing what the other possible hosts could be, primarily looking at walnut, red maple, or things like china berry, uh, poison ivy, things like that, knowing the host, but specifically knowing what tree of heaven looks like is very important. Many states have used their master gardeners and used the university system to provide training on knowing what the tree of heaven looks like, knowing how to identify it. It's very valuable for the public and others to be able to know what that host looks like. Also knowing what the lookalikes look like in terms of what could look like spotted lanternfly. So being aware of what spotted lanternfly is, what it looks like specifically, and then knowing what insects look very similar to spotted lanternfly is very important because we do get a lot of misreporting or reports of underwing moth and other insects that are not spotted lanternfly being reported. Taking pictures or collecting the insect. This is also very important, especially for the confirmation process. Taking photographs uh, that are geotagged especially are very important. We have had so far several misreports or false reports. Uh, both in iNaturalist and other uh, data collection tools, public pathways um, that have been uh, erroneous or, or just not correct. Uh, people do take pictures off the internet, unfortunately. And, and, and so taking pictures that are geotagged or some way of confirming exactly the host and the insect is very important. Collecting the insect is extremely important as well. And so collecting the insect, of course, in alcohol, uh, not transporting a live insect, but collecting the insect uh, with alcohol and sending it to the correct lab or the correct agency is very important, also helps confirm that it is indeed spotted lanternfly. Again, I mentioned geotagging or geolocation, GPS coordinates or geotagging, either with your phone or if you have the ability, if people have the ability, to put on a latitude and longitude and, and locate that with uh, a grid coordinate. That's very important to go back and confirm exactly the site where it was first located. Noting the host or again, or vegetation where the insect's located, 
goes back to knowing the host, but knowing specifically where it was found, what it was found on, extremely important for reporting for any state, any authority, knowing this information is key and really provides a foundation for understanding what it is that's been detected or found. In general, some states are using the tool survey one, two, three. I just give some examples here, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts are using the survey one, two, three. It is a survey tool that is online that is run off of websites and it gives people the ability to put in a lot of the information that I just mentioned. It allows them to add pictures and allows them to report through these Department of Agriculture websites and gives those, uh, those following up on these reports a lot of good information to follow up on. Some states are in general still using call-in numbers, 1-800-BAD-BUG or something of that nature uh, to call in. However, this takes a lot of resources for the states that are manning these numbers. They still need, somebody still needs to be able to man this phone number and respond when people do call in. There are also email uh, inboxes that are being used, general email uh, inboxes, email inboxes being used uh, by various states to be able to provide the same level of information through, through the email. But it does vary by state. So here's some examples that I'm going to give you and in the next couple of slides, just some examples of if you're in one of the states uh, that has spotted lanternfly, um, how they are collecting their information and their data. Uh, again, it, it varies by state, but here are some good examples. So for Rhode Island, uh, they're using hashtag beat the bug. And if you suspect uh, spotted lanternfly at Rhode Island, they're asking you to do really three simple things. And that's very important in your messaging exactly what you want people to do once they think they found spotted lanternfly. So making the message fairly simple, fairly straightforward is very key and will get you the best reporting. So in this case, spot, taking the photo, squash, they want you to kill the insect in this case, and then send or collect the specimen and report it using their website. In Massachusetts, they're using a outreach tool. Uh, this is a form that they ask you to fill out that collects much of the information that I previously covered in the slide before. They ask you for contact information, the host that it was found on, and then pictures, photographs, or any specimens. And then they're asking for specific location information on this form. New York Ag and Markets is using a similar tool. They're actually using Survey123, and I apologize, that's not a very good picture, but they're using Survey123 uh, to collect their information for any reports of anybody finding spotted lanternfly. And again, Survey123 actually is a survey tool and allows people to input the information, and then that information can then be transported and actually uh, built and put on this uh, displayed on a map on a survey map and then is able to be distributed among staff and it enables people to go out and confirm the spotted lanternfly detection where it was found and the host it was found on and if there are any more helps that surveyor or that person responding to further delimit uh, the area to see if there's any other spotted lanternfly in the area. Connecticut is relying on primarily its email and reporting and following instructions. This link that I that it shows you specifically gives you instructions on how to send a dead specimen to the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station. And so it is very simple. It's asking you to collect it and report it. Again, using their website and their collection form as well as their email. Pennsylvania has a pretty advanced reporting tool. Um, they're using a, a similar survey one, two, three type uh, database. Uh, they give a lot of good information. And then you can specifically click on the map to locate 
uh, where you're lo you know where you are, your location. It uh, basically uh, generates a set of GPS coordinates, and then you or you can put in your address, and then it will locate you on the map. Zoom in on the map, find the location or the nearest location uh, that's identifiable, and then helps you helps you uh, report exactly what it is you found. And so looking at this picture, you can see there in Potter County, uh, in, the, in the top of the map of Pennsylvania, uh, there's a yellow dot there. That was just something I was uh, using. I, I didn't report it, but I was using it just as a, as a, as a work through the tool. So that's kind of what it would look like. It would identify that on a map and then again, it, it translates into information and data for the Pennsylvania Department of Ag staff to be able to go out into that area and do some delimiting survey and look for exactly uh, if there is any spotted lanterfly in the area. This in addition also gives you kind of an idea if you look at the top there of the screen of the on the reporting tool, it gives you an idea of the time frame and the, the stage that you potentially could see uh, September to May, obviously egg masses, early nymph, May to July, late nymphs, July to August, and then of course the adults anytime from ju late July into December. So it kind of gives the, the user an idea of what they should be seeing at that time of year. Uh, very helpful, obviously, when identifying whether or not they've, they've truly found spotted lanternfly. New Jersey is using a similar form. Uh, and have a map location similar to Pennsylvania, a little somewhat similar to Pennsylvania. Again, submit uh, having contact information of the submitter uh, and then also citing in the location using a map to be able to locate where they're located or where they're finding the spotted lanternfly. Delaware is using an online submission form. Again, very similar submission form to New Jersey. Uh, DDA is also using a hitchhiker bug at Delaware.gov so that they're able to send in the information. And there is a lot of information coming through email so that their inspectors can get out uh, and again, detect or confirm the detection from the submission. Virginia, Virginia Cooperative Extension is asking for photographs um, as well as collecting the suspect lanternfly and then contacting the local office. And then you can find their local office through their webpage, but they're actually asking you to contact, reach out and contact by phone the local office and then taking the photo and or, or suspect specimen and submitting it to the office. In Indiana, it's a phone number and an email calling in that 18866 no exotic uh, and reporting it, as well as submitting any photos or information by email. West Virginia uses bugbusters at wvda.us. And again, using that detection email, people are sending in emails. Um, they're asking you that you take a photo before trying to kill it. Again, some people smash it or kill it uh, pretty sufficiently to the point that it's hard to determine from a picture whether or not you're looking at spotted lanternfly or what exactly it is you're looking at. So that's why a lot of states will ask, please take a picture first, and then if you're going to kill it or smash it, do so afterwards. In Ohio and Michigan, again, uh, Ohio is using a uh, the Ohio Plant Pest Reporter. This is from their website. Again, it's a form asking for basic information from the submitter uh, who's observing or submitting the, the find and then looking specifically at the county where the pest was found and providing that information to Ohio Department of Agriculture. In Michigan, obviously eyes in the field, Michigan Department of Natural Resources, uh, having an, an ob observer information and also information as to where exactly the location of where this insect was found uh, and being reported from. 
Certainly, uh, USDA APHIS, we have our general website as well as our Hungry Pests website. And on our website, what we have done is we have referred to the specific reporting uh, by state. So currently we have a listing, we need to update it a little bit, I think, but we will continue to update that based on the reporting requirements and the various states that are asking for the information. So we're providing that list. It's a good place to go um, and, and look on how to, how to report and respond if you think you found spotted lanternfly. That certainly is something that you could include. Um, it also gives instructions on how specifically those states are asking the reporting being, the, the report should be done, whether they want pictures, whether they want an insect collected, if they want an email or a phone number, all that is being included in the instructions on our public facing general website. Going just, just briefly going into some of the treatments that we've been doing, uh, we've been treating. So as people find the insect, in some cases we are going out and we are doing some treatments ourselves uh, within PPQ or within uh, the state itself is going out and doing treatments. Again, we're prioritizing our treatments. So we may work with the State Department of Ag or State Department of Natural Resources when reports come in to, to locate those insects. And again, if we're going to go out and treat, we will follow up with those homeowners, those landowners to make sure that we have access and we have permission to go on and, and conduct these treatments. So again, reporting is very important and it really feeds into the whole operational cycle and what comes next. Some of the research activities, I just wanted to cover this real briefly. We are looking for, you know, some of the research activities we're talking about, survey and trapping, treatments, biology and rearing, especially we're looking to rear colonies in the lab. There are several efforts going on there pathway and predictive modeling, as well as biological control. <coughs> Excuse me. So a lot of these things are very important to the program and important to our understanding of the spotted lanternfly as we go forward. Finally, outreach is very and a very, very important part of the program. Reporting, reporting as part of our outreach and educational effort. Uh, we have, uh, worked very closely with the National Plant Board, that is an association, a group of state plant regulatory officials throughout the United States. Uh, we work very closely with them as partners. We also are working very closely with industry, transportation, nurseries and growers and retail and getting the message to them, working with our partners to make sure that they're educated about what the insect looks like, what the host looks like, and then what, what do we want them to do What's the outreach message um, when they find it? Scrape the egg, squash them, kill the insect. Of course, reporting is a very important part. And we're using all, all really social media, live media, websites, pest alerts, any way we can get that message out, uh, we continue to do so. And that's all I have for today. I thank you again for your time. Uh, I hope that uh, you have a little bit of an insider idea on how to report for spotted lanternfly. Again, knowing what you're looking for, knowing what the hosts are, then being familiar with how you report it specifically in your state or where you should go to look for that information is very important in the reporting process as it feeds again into the operational cycle and whether or not there's somebody going to follow up to go out, confirm, and then treat, certainly go out and confirm, but then what comes next all starts with accurate reporting and, and getting the right information and the right data. So thank you, everybody. Again, I appreciate your time. Uh, I don't know, I assume I have some time for some questions.
looking at uh, I'm looking at the question and answer. I see. What are my thoughts on using the first question? What are my thoughts using the Bugwood apps like Great Lakes Early Detection Network to report? I think those are great tools. Um, certainly, we've seen them used um, similar to what we've seen with uh, iNaturalist and some other reporting tools. Uh, I think the important part is, again, collecting the right information, but also making sure that the right people are getting the information or somebody is aware of how those things are being reported and, and checking those websites or checking those tools. Uh, Great Lakes Early Detection Network, I know has been used uh, for spotted lanternfly reporting specifically, especially in the Mid-Atlantic, um, as well as I know, I, I believe in Ohio and other states have been also using some of those tools. And again, very important, good information provided there uh, just making sure that that information is translated and gets to the right hands, the right agencies and the right people to be able to go out and confirm uh, whether or not there are spotted lanternfly populations or whether or not uh, there's any confirmation of spotted lanternfly in the area. I think those are, are great tools though, however. Yes, yeah, certainly I will, I will be able to provide the, uh, the slide presentation. That would not be a problem. I'll provide that to Robin, and Robin can then provide it to the group uh, of attendees today. Uh, share more about oil treatment for egg masses. So golden pest spray oil has been very effective uh, for, for our purposes. We've done a lot of research using uh, our science and technology staff have, have run multiple trials. We've been doing a two-year trial now, it concluded the second year, concluded this year, using golden pest spray oil uh, and monitoring those sites, uh, setting up those sites and monitoring those sites that we treat in comparison to an untreated plot. And what we're seeing right now is 60 to 70% of the egg masses we're treating uh, have been eliminated. Um, we, it also depends on time of year and then the application. The application is very important, making sure that there's a good application of the golden pest spray oil on the egg masses, that's not too late in the year. The timing, we are starting our treatments actually as early as this November. We find that we can treat egg masses uh, this late fall and have good efficacy on those egg masses, treating them. And then also again in the early spring, Unlike other insects, waiting until later in the year, closer to the time they hatch, we've actually seen variable efficacy on treating them uh, when they're closer to hatch. Um, and treating them with the golden oil has not been as effective as getting to them earlier. Um, temperature also plays a part. Obviously, colder temperatures, things like golden oil tend to uh, not react well to colder temperatures. It congeals, it becomes very hard to work with, it becomes solidified uh, in colder temperatures. So once we drop below 40, golden press spray oil really uh, is something that we're not using. And then we're going back to actually scraping and removing the, uh, the egg masses themselves. But hopefully we'll have uh, a good data set from the work that we've been doing over the last two years to really talk specifics in terms of the efficacy but we know we're having a, a big impact on the population and the sites we're treating. Um, one thing that is that does need to be considered, of course, is where the egg masses are located. As many people may be aware, uh, a lot of the egg masses, a lot of the egg masses many times can be very high on the tree. And so reach is very important and getting to them is very important. And so with a lot of egg masses in the upper canopy, that does become a challenge because we're only able to treat really what we can reach. And that's true of a lot of chemical or a lot of uh, our control tactics as is what we can reach is, is how, we can, how we can best get to those egg masses is 
is most effective. So that is something that we are uh, aware of and, and we know that we're getting to a certain number of egg masses, but we are showing that we are impacting the overall population. And in some areas, we are really reducing the numbers uh, by that tactic uh, using golden pest spray oil on egg masses. Rail companies, yeah, rail companies, have they been receptive or responsive about SLF? Are they concerned? Um, no, I'll be honest with you, they're not, they don't seem too concerned about spotted lanternfly uh, on the railroad. Um, they have been receptive, fairly receptive to us getting access. It has taken us a lot of time to work through the process with them, and we kind of continue to work with them I'm, bet, I'm trying to refine the process, trying to make it easier. I know right now it's very frustrating because it, it goes from state to state and it sometimes varies, but we have been successful with CSX and Norfolk Southern, the two major tier one railroads uh, that really uh, encompass most of the area. It, uh, it's really an area, we've been very successful working with them. We've been su fairly successful working with short lines. Uh, these are small companies that, you, that own short rail lines. And a lot of times they're a lot more local. So getting those local contacts has been important, but the railroad has been, it's been a challenge, that's for sure. Hashtags and social media. We have had quite a lot, especially in New York, using the hashtags uh, in New York has been very effective in social media and has really, as you know, increased the reporting. Um, that's been very important. Um, using those hashtags uh, has, has really increased the level of reporting as Spotted Lanternfly made its way into New York City, especially. And we've gotten a lot of reports through through the use of hashtags and social media. And, and as, as many people can go on the internet and see, a lot of New Yorkers are very annoyed and, and concerned about spotted lanternfly in the city and what it's doing there and the impact it's having on their life and lifestyle um, certainly is something that we've seen a lot of reporting through social media and the use of hashtags has certainly facilitated that. All right, I don't see any other questions at this point, unless anybody has any further questions for me. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Again, I appreciate your time. Um, and I hope that uh, this was in very informative. As always, you can reach out to me. Uh, certainly, Robin can feel free to share my email address if they, if anybody has any further questions or want to follow up on anything that, that I said during the presentation. That is certainly we can, um, we can uh, follow up on and discuss. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time.